Hello and welcome to another devlog for my Terraria clone made using Pygame and Python. It's been some time since my last video in general, let alone for this project. But I've been busy, so don't you worry. Over the past six months I've been working on and off on a collection of data tools for the game. And today I'm going to take you on the journey of creating these tools and then using them to make my generated structures more interesting. So, let's get started. To start with, I'd like to show you why tools are a great thing for game development. If you're familiar with tools regarding game dev already, then you can use the timestamps in the progress bar to skip ahead. For those of you who are yet to be enlightened, prepare yourselves. I'm sure some, if not most of you, have some kind of experience when it comes to trying to get data into your games, whatever they may be, so you'll probably be able to relate to this in some way. So say for example you have a tile map of numerical IDs representing different states, and you want the ID 0 to be coloured blue id1 to be green, and 2 red. How do you make that happen? The first thing a new programmer will do is the only thing they know how. They'll start adding if statements. They'll make one if stroke elif for every id they have and set the colour accordingly. Brilliant. And they might also decide that they want each tile type to give a passing player unit varying resources based on this id. So again, they get to work with the if statements, this time in a completely different area of the code. Awesome. Now, they could continue to do this, and it would most likely be fine for a game of this complexity and scale, but when it comes to future expandability, this would become a headache-inducing mess. They would have to hunt down every if statement that checks an ID when they want to add a new one. Not to mention, anyone wishing to tweak the behaviours of the game would need to know the entire codebase to do so. This is known as hard coding and should be avoided at all costs. So we don't want to do that. What do we want to do? What's the next step up? A more experienced programmer would probably opt for some kind of list or map within the project source that could be indexed with the ID in question to look up specific data related to that part of the code. In our case, the colour and resource game would be stored for every ID in one place. This would mean that when we want to add a new ID to our tile map, all we have to do is add another element to our data array, and potentially tweak some unique tile functionality in the code. This is the kind of thing I did for the majority of my smaller projects in Python and Pygame, and it works great. It's fairly expandable, keeps our data consistent throughout, and is moderately easy for someone new to the project to understand and add to it. But what if we want to go higher? What if we want people even unfamiliar with code to be able to tinker with the game's logic and even share their changes? That's where data tools come in. Before we can start using tools to edit our game data, the data itself needs to be stored somewhere outside the game's source so that both the tools and the game can access it. These files also tend to be in readable formats such as XML or JSON so that they can be changed manually if required. Tools can then be set up to read and write to these files. This will allow for a user not from a code background to write data for our game with ease. Even if you don't plan on making tools to edit your data, it's still a good idea to keep the data external to the source in a readable format. This way, a new user will have a better chance of understanding the data and would be able to easily share their changes if necessary. The idea of using tools to create data for games is something I have only really considered since starting my job. Many tools with specific jobs I use to allow for designers and artists to have lots of control over the game's logic, levels, and UI. They are invaluable to game development in large teams, and even help speed up content creation in smaller teams as well. So, options. What can we use? The most common way tools are created is with Windows Presentation Foundation, or WPF, or Windows Forms. Both of these allow for user interfaces to be easily created for Windows-based applications. Then there's good old Pygame and other graphics libraries where you'd have to create your own UI system from scratch, or use one that someone else has made, like 4PY. I'm somewhat familiar with Windows Forms, as I've used it to make a network chat app in year two of my university course, but I wasn't a massive fan, and I've never touched WPF, so in my eyes it was an obvious choice. I like the challenge and I'm very familiar with it, so I went with Pygame and opted to create my own UI library. At the time, I had various ideas for how I would set up a UI system in Pygame, but I settled on the following. Several instances of a class called a UI container would represent panes in a window. These instances would be created by splitting an existing pane along a given line in either axis, creating two new panes, or UI containers. Because the new panes would always be inside the original pane being split, it would make sense to consider them children of the main pane. Because both children will have the same width or height, depending on the axis they were split along, it's not too much work to make the panes draggable in the axis perpendicular to the split. It also makes sure that the mouse can only ever be over one active pane at any given time. The panes without a split line, and thus the ones that had no children, could be filled with various instances of a different class known as a widget. 
Widgets allow for data entry in a variety of ways, including basic checkboxes, buttons, and line selection widgets, which will allow for the content of an entire line to be selected. There are several different text entry boxes for things like ints, floats, strings, and tuples. All of these text input widgets bar the string variant will validate the input the user gives. For example, entering just a single value into a tuple field will autofill a second one. Then there's the various drop-down widgets to allow for selection of one or more items in a list, or maybe just to perform one of several actions. Drop-down widgets can also have optional icons set for each element. These icons can be used to help illustrate what that particular action will do. So you can see here the, the first three are regular images, but the last one is a mystery. Or just another angle. Some of these widgets will be purely for showing the state of data, so primarily text and image widgets. And finally, organization widgets, such as a collapse widget, which would allow for content within its close and open statements to be hidden. This widget system is sort of inspired by DRIM GUI, a UI debugging tool for DirectX and OpenGL applications, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. I also have a few widgets that I would like to add in the future, for example, a graph editor widget. Such a widget would allow for a spline to be created for a set range and domain. Then in the code, the graph could be sampled in the x-axis to retrieve the corresponding y-value. This could be really useful for things like specifying a probability of spawning various entities at a given depth in the world. I would also like to add a search bar widget, which would limit the visibility of a given UI container's widgets based on a search string. And maybe a float slash int slider would be useful as well. If you're interested in the future of this project, you can view its Trello page from the link in the description. So, we've gone through all the widgets that we want to have, but we haven't gone through how we plan to place them inside the UI containers. This task was one of the more challenging ones for this UI system, and I didn't nail it the first time. The following solution is the least janky one I could come up with. So, a UI container's widgets are basically just stored in a big list of where the order is important. And the job of the widget placement code is basically just to run through this list and figure out how to place each widget in the UI container. If you want widgets to be placed on the same line, you'll need to add another kind of organization slash structure widget called a same line widget in between them. There is also a variant of the same line widget that allows you to specify a pixel length to extend the white space to so that elements can be aligned like this. And that's pretty much how all the widgets are placed in the UI containers. It's pretty simple, right? It only really starts getting a little complex when you want to start allowing for line alignment and create widgets that need to know the length of the line before placement. I don't want to go too in-depth code-wise, so I'm just going to do a brief run-through. So, we start by running through and hiding any widgets that need to be hidden because of collapse widgets. Then we run through again, through all the widgets, and group them together by the line that they are on. The current number of tabs is also adjusted when passing collapse widgets here. When there are no more widgets left to add to the line, the extents of the line are calculated using the createExtents function, and a new line is created. Widgets can know their dimensions based purely off information they were given when they were created. For example, the text widget can use the font.size function of the font that it was given, or just straight up render the text and get the size of that instead. Some widgets will need to be updated later on as they'll want to overlap with other widgets. And this would screw up placement if it was done here. So, with all the lines now processed, we can work out the size that the widget surface will need to be to accommodate for all the widgets plus padding. We then check if the content has exceeded the size of the container. If it has, then we need to add scroll bars, etc. And if it's smaller than the container, then we need to increase the size of the widget surface to fill to the edges. The widgets are then given their actual positions in the UI container inside the arrange widgets on line function. This is also where alignment is handled, and finally the late position update function is called on all active widgets. This allows them to update their sizes without affecting the placement of other widgets. For most widgets, this function is left blank, and is only overridden by a select few, namely the line selector and begin collapse widgets. Right, and that's pretty much it. At this point, every widget should be where it needs to be. And uh, it definitely could be improved in areas in terms of like optimization, but uh, it's worked a treat for me so far, so I think it's fine. So now that we have plans for the UI containers and widgets, how can we make a functioning set of tools with them? When I first started, I didn't really put too much thought into what parts of the tool should be reusable across all of them. I naively assumed that the only reusable UI would be the header bar, the title, and the icon. So for some time, while I was working on the item tool, they were the only things set up in the base tool, which every tool inherits from. When I got around to starting work on the tile tool, I copied the instance list, this container right here, and its sorting functionality to the tile tool, which was quite a lot of code. It was then that I realized that most of the tools would have an instance list and a property page, so they too became part of the base tool. 
Now it's super easy for me to create another tool to edit another set of instances. Child tools can simply just override the load property page for entity function and set up some simple metadata about where it should be saving and loading its instances from. And it should just work. Even the little export and reload buttons at the top should work. Something I would like to add to the base tool is the ability to edit multiple entity or instance types in one tool. This would allow, for example, the world tool to edit world gen types as well as any other world related instances, for example, dynamic spawn heights or something. But yeah, that can wait for now. And naturally, on the visual side of things, I had to create minimalistic Adobe esque icons for all of my tools, or I just wouldn't be doing them any justice. Other than that, I basically just picked a few muted colours for the headers of all the tools, and then used an assortment of low kind of greys for the background and buttons and whatnot. So with the initial and vastly incomplete tech design cemented in my brain, I got to work implementing as soon as I could. The first thing I worked on was the UI container split functionality. These splits began as a permanent, unchangeable split, but quickly evolved to be draggable with restrictions. Around this time, I also added my first iteration of the widget placement code, and a few simple widgets, i.e. the checkbox, text, and button widgets. And for the most part, things just went to plan. I did end up taking a ton of videos during the development of the general tool work but the vast majority of them are just incredibly uneventful. <laughs> so I've condensed it all down to a few nifty features I added and some interesting issues I encountered for your viewing pleasure. You may have noticed in the newer footage that some of the widgets have a background with a nice looking gradient. To begin with, this is just a flat color and sometimes an outline, as can be seen here. This looked a little boring, so I made a function that all the widgets call instead of drawing a background rect. It takes a widget surface to write to and a color. Depending on the style set in a global variable, a different background style will be drawn. I made two gradient styles, one that used an array of gradually darkening circles, and one array of rectangles around the border. I also experimented with a sheen style that draws two white slanted polygons on the right side of the widget to imitate a sheen. But I think with a lot of these it looks a bit stupid, so I rarely ever use it. And then I've also got a fallback option which does it the old way and just fills the surface with the colour. All of the widget styles draw lines above and below the widget afterwards to create a simple emboss effect. It wouldn't be too difficult to add some more widget styles, but for now, these are enough. Another quality of life feature I added was several cursor types. Initially, when hovering over interactable widgets, the cursor remained as the default pointer. This looks more or less fine if there was a widget hover outline, but in most applications, hovering a button tends to also change the cursor to indicate that the thing you're hovering is interactable. There are a few inbuilt cursors to choose from in Pygame, but I was surprised at how few there actually were. There's like, a diamond? Why would you ever need that? <laughs> in the end, I had to create my own. This is done by creating a 2D array of X's, periods, and spaces, then giving it to Pygame and telling it to create a cursor. It was pretty finicky to get working, but I managed to make a pointy finger cursor, a text box hover cursor, and while I was at it, I had some fun and made a really long finger pointer as well. <laughs> now, when a widget is hovered, they can change the cursor to whatever's appropriate, which in the case of the checkbox widget, is a massive finger. Adding just this alone makes it feel more like a proper interactable UI, as opposed to just some fancily coloured rectangles in a window posing as one. So, when I was adding the text input widgets, I tried to make a smart move and create a map with plug-in key objects as the keys for the map, and characters that should be placed in the string when you press the key for the values. I also made a map to convert regular chars into shifted chars. The idea was that you would just index the map with the key from the event to get the char to add to the string, and if shift was pressed, you would index the shift map with that character and add the result to the string. This took a good hour or so to do, and it worked alright but it had some really weird issues where events for certain keys just weren't being picked up for some reason. So I looked on the Pygame wiki and realized there's a Unicode attribute which allows you to get the char with shift and caps lock already applied. Upon discovering this, the emotions I felt were a mixture of embarrassment and relief, but mainly just embarrassment. All of that effort could have been avoided had I just set the char to this Unicode event attribute. God damn it. Because fonts tend to only have glyphs for the standard characters, some of the characters you can enter won't actually be able to be rendered. This isn't a massive issue though, I trust that anyone using the tools isn't going to try and start spamming tabs and such for no reason. Can't guarantee though. 
because each widget's surface is drawn to the UI container's content surface when the content is updated, all the widgets can be nicely clipped by specifying an area rect when blitting the whole content surface to the screen. I like this because it meant that you didn't have to faff around with clipping recs when drawing every widget, you just blit it to the content surface and the UI container will handle the rest. However, I hadn't considered that I would want outlines and selection recs for widgets, i.e. shapes being drawn separately and over the top of the content surface. When I first added them, it didn't even cross my mind that it would cause an overlap issue in certain circumstances. It was when I saw one being drawn over the top of a different UI container that I realised my idiocy. In the end, I was forced to do what I was trying to avoid in the first place. I faffed around with rec clipping for every widget that needed a dynamic outline. <sighs> one often meets his destiny on the road he takes to avoid it. Mm. Monkey! Right, so at this point in time, I had pretty much everything I needed to get started with the structure tool, and the following is what I needed from it. I needed to be able to create varying sized grids to hold per cell info for tiles, walls, and connections, and any other stuff like chest loop, etc. And each one of these grids would represent a single piece slash part of a structure. The game could then use the connection data stored in each part to work out which other part should be connected to unused connections, sort of like how you'd make a marble run, but in more possible directions. You'd look for the bits that aren't connected, and connect them. So for a connection facing down, it would search for parts with the connection facing up of the same type. It would also need to store rectangles for every structure already placed on the map so it doesn't place a structure over the top of another one. I mean, if children can build marble runs, then it shouldn't be too difficult for us, once we have our data, to write some code to do a similar thing for our structures. The thing that would set the structure tool apart from some of the other tools is that it would need a dedicated widget type. It would be very difficult to set up the required data, like a 2D grid, using the currently available text inputs and dropdowns. A dedicated widget is required. I did think about creating a general tile editing widget, but I scrapped the idea because I'm pretty sure that the structure tool is the only one that will ever need it. Right, so let's get to the implementation. As with the previous segments, I did record a bunch of videos making this tool, but I'll try to limit how many I show so we're not here all night. Very early into the creation of the structure tool, I realised I would need to create a tool for a wall data first, as the structure was going to need info about the walls it can place. The wall tool is basically just a simpler version of the tile tool, so it wasn't that hard to implement. I also quickly created a sound tool, because why not? It allows for sound variation groups to be created and assigned to IDs. The game can then just request a random sound from the group to be played. Only a select few groups actually have more than one sound variation at the moment though, for example, the run and stone hit sounds. I also created icons for the tools I had added to the collection, but hadn't created icons for. To improve the look of some of the drop down menus, I also ripped some icons from Windows and Paint.net for things like loading and exporting. Then I got to work implementing the structure tool, and before long I had the basic parts of the structure tool working, i.e. the basic tile and wall placement, a resizable grid, and saving and loading. So I've just completed the work for the structure tool. Um, Everything is now in from what I want from this tool. You can create a varying size uh, like structure uh, section, I would guess you'd call it. So there's a separate view mode, so we can see which walls. Very nice. Open and close it, it would work otherwise. And we can go here, and we can see we've got our other chest with the pots loop. And we can delete that and then replace it with air. And that kind of leads on to the thing that I need to do next. So at the moment, this is basically just storing a reference to the loot in the loot tool. Um, but this just doesn't actually do anything, and the game's not going to know any data about this. So the next. Hello. So I just implemented the loot tool. So now uh, it doesn't just point to nowhere. These chests. So, well, I haven't actually explored that one with the previous changes, let's just quickly do that. Boop. Yeah, so now this points to chest wood, and then I can go into my loot tool and see the chest wood. I haven't actually set the data for it yet, but say if it was a set to pot, then I could use this information to then generate loot for that chest. So the reason I'm using these scalar values for weights instead of using, say, a chance uh, that adds up to one um, is so that I don't have to keep um, adjusting these values so they always add up to one. Basically the way it will work is when it needs to make a decision um, about which item to pick, it will uh, run through all of them and get a cumulative total of all of the weights. So these all might add up to, say, 200. They don't, but they might. So then it would pick a random number between 1 and 200 and then run through the list again. So the first item would be 100, say, say it randomed 100 and, I don't know, 20. Um, it would go through the first one, it would say, is 120 less than 100? No, it's not. So let's, you know, remove that first item and move on to the next. 
and then it also minuses 100 off the number it's looking at. So then it will be looking at 20, and it says, is 20 less than 50? Yes, it is. So let's pick this item. This is a concept that will likely be used throughout the tools. So it's already used in the structures as well. They're all set to some base 100 value at the moment, but yeah. So they can have kind of rare rooms like this root chest. It's got a chest in the root. Uh, you know, that would be kind of something you want to be rare. So you could set this weight to be, you know, 10 or something lower. Before I integrated my amazing new tool created data into the game, I thought it'd be a good idea to clean up the projects again. This time adhering to Pepe starting more strictly. This meant going through well over 5,000 lines of code and changing variable names and removing redundant semicolons. As you can imagine, this took bloody forever, and I can't remember the total number of hours it took me, but the nights did seem to blend together. I slowly began to consider if it wasn't the tool data I was integrating into the game, but my very being. Nevertheless, I soldered it on. Copy. Paste. After several evenings of doing nothing but project cleanup, I was feeling a little restless and decided to get a little creative. I designed some Overwatch themed mouse mats for myself and a couple of friends using nothing but paint.net and in-game screenshots. It ended up taking around 4-5 to five hours in total to complete, but it was definitely worth the time. When designing them, I made sure that they had the correct aspect ratio of the mouse mat we were looking to buy, but they still managed to screw up the borders, cutting them off almost entirely in some areas. I think it still looks pretty good though. I also did some music production in FL Studio, and my first track is actually what you're listening to right now. It's aptly named Starting Somewhere. I also had a pop at creating a day theme for my Terraria clone, but it's still very much a work in progress, so I've left it out of the game for now. And the last of my creative energy was funneled into rebranding the channel. I tried to make the logo a bit more visually pleasing, changing it from my initials in plain text to something with a bit more depth, uh, but retaining the original colours. Again, this is all done in paint.net, which I must say has more potential than you might think at first glance. I published the changes the other day, and clearly someone wasn't having any of it. So, feeling adequately refreshed, I got back to it and finished up the project cleanup. The first times I got the game running again using the new data for tiles, items and walls etc, things were a tad broken, and it took a fair amount of time to get things back to normal. No doubt there are still going to be some bugs lurking in the less thoroughly tested parts of the game, so if you find one, I'd appreciate it if you could either create an issue for it on the GitHub, or send me a DM on Discord. Cheers. Whilst I was integrating multi-tiles back in, I made the logic for the doors to be more generic in the form of a cyclable tag. It allows for data to be specified about which tile it should switch to when right-clicked. This should allow for more doors and various similar tiles to be created without hassle. Anyway, with many issues ironed out and the game in a somewhat playable state, I had the pleasure of deleting the old hard-coded data. It was a truly beautiful moment. I couldn't enjoy it for too long though. I got swiftly back to work implementing the new structure generation logic using our new structure data. This task ended up taking a whole night to finish. I had to make sure that they handled pre-existing data correctly, existing multi-tiles being overwritten must not be split in half or anything, this would corrupt them and likely crash when they need to be interacted with later on. As per usual there were some stupid bugs, one of the bugs was every possible type of part that could be added to a um, connection was added, and so you get all this overlapping business. It ended up being pretty simple, just a missing break statement after a structure had been chosen for a specific connection. There are also a few issues regarding structure placement weights, but alas, we got it all working, and so now we can have structures extruding in all kinds of directions without collisions. Hooray! So, I finally had what I'd set out to achieve in the game, but these new and improved mine shafts just weren't cutting it for me. While I had that motivational momentum, I also made a bunch of improvements, some related and some not so much, but to save you from the hours of video, I've again condensed them into several sections, so enjoy. So first up was a day-night cycle. Somehow I had never thought to add one until now. <laughs> Seems like one of the early things you do once you add lighting, but hey. This is a fairly simple task. You just change the global light value, which is the light value that will be emitted from any empty tile above the surface, from a constant value to one that fluctuates from low to high over a set period. 
and the sine graph is the obvious choice for behavior like this, as it would also ease in and out of the transitions. So making the light value follow the base sine graph yields a result like this. I find that the transitions between night and day take up more time than is desirable using the base sample. To fix this issue, we can effectively run our output back through the sine function, or just this specific part of it, and it should smooth things out even more, meaning that we spend more time close to 0 and 1 as opposed to the in-betweens. I find that this improves the overall look of our cycle, which is what's currently playing in the background. To complement this, I also added some new background types to switch to when it's dusk or dawn, or night, to aid with the transition. Now it's looking pretty spicy. I spent quite a lot of time tweaking the animations for the melee weapons so that they actually look half decent. Beforehand, the weapon was swung, but was often disconnected to the player's arm. It looked okay, but I kind of hated it. Now, when an item is equipped, it renders the item image to a separate surface, padded, to allow for rotations not to be clipped at the edges. It then works out the angle that needs to rotate the surface on that particular frame, given the progress through the swing and the direction the player is facing. This angle is interpolated from the start and end points. It then offsets the item to be at the hand. An additional offset can also be set in the item data to say how close to the centre of the image the player should be holding the item. The default value for this is to hold at the centre, which is why a lot of the tiles are held in the centre. These offsets are applied using a pretty simple trig, which I can show on screen here. And this looked good, primarily with fast swinging items, but it often appeared to slip out of the player's hand on slower swinging items. I found the reason for this to be because the frames that I used to animate the arms of the player slightly ease out towards the end of the animation. This means that I would need to ease out my currently linear animation. Similar to the day-night cycle stuff, I just mapped the progress float to a part of the sine graph so that it sped up through the start of the animation and slowed at the end. I then tweaked it by lerping it back to the original value by a set amount, and I think I've made it just about perfect. I also allowed for an override image to be set in the tool so that larger weapon images can be used if necessary like this massive sword, dubbed the God Slayer. I also fixed the largely broken physics item animations, making them work better with their movement. So you can see here that when they fly out, they sort of look like they're rolling until they hit the ground and stop. Ranged weapons now actually use ammo, which is a hell of a step up. <laughs> you can now specify what ammo type a weapon should use, and it will automatically use any ammo in your inventory of that type when you fire. Ammo can also have an effect on the projectile that leaves the ranged weapon. For example, loading coins into a musket will not work as well as using a musket ball. There'll be a lot of drag and not a lot of damage or knockback. I plan to add a dedicated ammo slot section in the inventory so that you don't accidentally fire all your coins when you don't intend to. But for now, I'll just add that to the Trello board. After seeing a lot of recent changes to Minecraft's cave generation through Twitter and Snapchat videos, I decided to make some improvements to my cave generation as well. I implemented what a lot of people now call spaghetti caves. This is done by making noise samples that fall in the middle range, so around minus 0.2 to 0.2, as air tiles, as opposed to my previous method, which was making the higher sections of the noise air, so say for above 0.5. This means that caves will now more likely be long and stringy, as opposed to blobby and disconnected. While working on this, I thought it'd be useful to see more of the terrain that I was generating without having to mine down really far, so I wrote some code to convert the whole map into an image and save it to disk. This is pretty easy, as all the tiles already have a colour, taken from their tile image. Some of them also override this colour, but it's mainly just generated from the image. This colour was previously used to make particles and stuff appear when you jump on blocks, but it works here as well. So it was just a case of drawing a bunch of rectangles to a surface and saving it. And this really really helped me to see what was going on when things were generating. So this snapshot is taken from a world that used my old world generation. You can see that the caves can be sometimes quite wide, but are never very long. And this is a world snapshot with the new terrain generation. You can see that the new caves tend to string on for quite some time. It also made me realise that these maps are far too deep for no reason. <laughs> like, these, this one is a thousand blocks. So I changed the available world sizes to be less deep. This makes generating and loading a large world around twice as fast. It also got me thinking about the possibility of adding a mini-map which is effectively what I'd already created, I just wasn't rendering it, I was saving it. Obviously there'd be a lot more to look into there, like cropping and adding the lighting, but yeah, it could, you know, be a doable task. In addition to the mine shafts, I also wanted to create some kind of structures that would spawn further down in the world, so that there would be some kind of incentive to dig further down. 
Terraria has these little underground cabins dotted around underground pretty frequently, and I thought this would be the perfect thing to attempt. With the structure tool now created, it was extremely easy to jump in and create several underground cabin modules, and then add some code in the generation logic to spawn a number of these underground in random locations, and then just hit play. The first world I hopped into, I knew something was off. It seemed like the entire underground has been replaced with cabins. It was sort of eerie, in a way. I took a look using the newfound world snapshot feature, and this is what I saw. Yep, something was definitely going wrong here. <laughs> it ended up being because I had added connections to the doors for every part. This may not sound like an issue, but with a max recursion depth of 20, and a part with doors on either side, it basically just spammed 20 in one direction and 20 in the other and then it also went down one and did it again. Removing the connections on the doors and adjusting the spawn wakes of the parts stopped this monstrosity from happening in the future. And they were looking pretty nice. You may have noticed the paintings on the walls. Before adding these there were only pots and chests and stuff and it seemed a bit lifeless. So I made a few multi-tile paintings in paint.net and placed them in the underground cabin rooms. They could still do with maybe a chandelier or two, but they look pretty acceptable now, and I'm definitely never going to give them up. Using these tools honestly makes working on concept of the game so much easier. I'd rather rip my fingernails off than go back to writing tile data directly into an array. <laughs> and the great thing is that they're kind of just separate to the game. I could use these tools that I've made for Figaria to aid with another Terraria clone in a completely different language. Or maybe, if I wanted to, I could use a modified version of these tools to create an entirely new game with a similar set of systems to Terraria. And even add some new unique ones. Wink wink, nudge nudge. I'm hoping that this video has given even just a few of you the motivation to return to that project, whatever it may be, and get it just that little bit closer to being complete. If you do return to it and get stuck, don't hesitate to drop me a comment and I'll try and help you out. Or you could join our adequately cosy Discord server and ask for a hand there. There's not many of us, but I'm sure someone can give you a hand. Alright, um, I'll see you in the next one then, where I'll probably be overhauling the tile blending and hooking up a few more tools. And uh, thank you for the generous support. 350 subscribers. Holy heck, damn.